So without further ado, I'd like to invite my panelists up because we're really here to listen to them today. And I'm very excited. I've invited each of them because I was really inspired by the work that they were doing. So if I could have Dr. Peggy Chabrian, Dr. Sharon DeVivo, Dean Flannery, Ryan Gum, and Captain Steve Dixon join me on the stage, I'd greatly appreciate it. like a receiving line. So as we just discussed, RA is working on a proposal to reconnect the pilot training career pipeline. As we continue to pursue this specific solution, we know the problem of pilot supply demands a long-term holistic approach to encourage more young men and women to take flight in the first place, then to provide support, guidance, and investment throughout their careers. I've invited the panelists to speak because, as I said, they're, they are thought leaders in this space, and I admire the work that each of you are doing. I will introduce our panels very briefly, but I'd encourage you to look at their full bios in the app because they all have really incredible backgrounds. So I'll ask a couple of questions to get us started, and then I'm gonna open it up to a mix of moderated and audience questions. There will be a roving mic, so if you wanna ask a question, please stand, and we'll make our way over to you. See Liam there, raise your hand, Liam. He's our microphone man, and he will find you and offer you the mic. Each speaker is, like I said, their, bio, their full bio is on the page, but I'm gonna start with just a couple of brief remarks. So joining us from Women in Aviation International is Dr. Peggy Chabrian. As president and founder, Peggy has steered the growth of WAI since it was incorporated in 1994, with today's membership totaling nearly 13,000 men and women from all segments of aviation industry, including general, corporate, commercial, and military. A longtime aviation enthusiast and professional aviation educator, Peggy is a 2,200-hour commercial instrument multi-engine pilot and flight instructor flying for over 30 years. Most recently, she added helicopter and seaplane ratings to, to her flight qualifications. That's pretty cool. We are pleased Dr. Sharon B. DeVivo is here with us. She's the seventh president of Vaughn College of Aeronautics and Technology and the only woman in the college's history. During her, during her 20 years with Vaughn, Sharon has been responsible for different areas of the institution, including academic affairs, development, admissions, financial aid, student affairs, and public affairs. Sharon has led efforts that help transform the college from a primarily a training institution to one that offers a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering, management, and aviation, and a, and a Master of Science degree. And I'm gonna guess that you were the only woman president, not necessarily the only woman. Maybe something missing from my notes. From the airline side, our hometown airline sponsor this week is Dean Flannery, president of PSA Airlines. Dean has been responsible for PSA's daily operations since August 2014, as in its lengthy airline experience with US Airways Express, US Airways, America West, and Continental Airlines. Since assuming his role at PSA, Flannery has used his experience to lead initiatives designed to enhance coordination, efficiency, and customer service at PSA, all while guiding the company through the impact of the merger of US Airways and American Airlines and the largest fleet expansion and growth of the regional airline. Another regional airline representative is Ryan Gum, president and CEO of Endeavor Air, a wholly owned subsidiary of Delta. An Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University graduate, Ryan has many years of managerial experience both inside and outside the cockpit. Ryan flew with Mesa Airlines, ascending the ranks to chief pilot and eventually director of operations. He led Freedom, Freedom Airlines operations as the airline's president and COO, as well as running Comair, first as vice president of op operations and then as president. Finally, providing us insight from a major airlines perspective, and thank you for being here, is Captain Steve Dixon, Senior Vice President, Flight Operations for Delta Airlines. Steve's responsibility includes overseeing Delta's day-to-day -day flight operations on six continents, as well as Delta's pilot training, pilot standards, technical support, pilot staffing, and scheduling, operational quality assurance, and regulatory compliance. So you're not busy as at all. Uh, and, and I think, Steve, you, you flew in here this morning, actually. You personally flew the, flew the line in. Is that right? Uh, yesterday afternoon. <laughs> okay, yesterday afternoon. So Steve also provides leadership and direction to Delta's 12,700 pilots. A 25-year uh, Delta veteran, Steve has served in a variety of leadership positions of increasing responsibilities, and he does fly the line as an A320 captain, has flown the B727, 737, 757, 7067. That's a lot of sevens during his career at Delta. Okay, let's begin, and I'm going to join the panelists. Rather than 
asking, am I mic'd here? Thanks. Rather than asking for opening remarks, I'd like to kick things off with a couple of moderated questions just to get going from each of our panelists. So we'll start off right on down the line with you, Peggy. Women in Aviation is doing tremendous work in the space of inspiring really young people to get engaged in aviation. So from the very beginning of their lifespan, in fact, you recently announced during your convention the Girl Scouts Aviation Patch. Can you tell us a little bit more about the programs that you offer in that very young age group for those people coming in and the inspiration that men, that women, and men, <laughs> and men for that matter, uh, draw from the work you're doing? Certainly. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, our program with young people actually kind of got its start about six years ago. We had a speaker who was coming to be a, a keynote at our event, uh, president of an aviation association. And he asked the question a couple months before the, the conference. He said, I have four daughters at home. Would it be okay if I brought a couple of them with me? Sure, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. So when sharing that at one of our staff meetings, uh, we said, you know, bring your, bring your daughter to the conference. Kind of sound like bring your daughter to work day. And out of that grew an idea. And we um, started a program at the conference on Saturday called bring your daughter to the conference. And it was granddaughters and nieces and so forth. Well, the next year we decided to expand it a little bit more and we advertised in the local community of the city we were at that year and uh, invited local school uh, children from schools from the girl scouts in the area to come in and be part of this bring your daughter to the conference well jumping ahead uh, we now have a program called girls in aviation day which is not only held at our annual conference but this past year in 2015 in september we said we have all these chapters we have over 100 chapters around the world why don't we ask them to host a similar event, uh, Girls in Aviation Day, in their local community in the fall. So 43 of our 100 chapters jumped on the, on the bandwagon and said, hey, we'd like to do this. The program is designed for young people, young girls ages 8 to 16. There's some hands-on activities, particularly for the younger girls, you know, building model airplanes, building an airport, uh, flight simulators, software programs. But the kind of great thing that happened in those local communities some of the chapters uh, engage with um, uh, airlines in their local area or uh, an aviation museum, um, manufacturers who said, hey, uh, you can hold your event here in our hangars or at our facilities and we'll help providing tours and, and other kinds of support for the program. There was also a component, particularly for the middle school, high school young ladies, a career emphasis. We had uh, these different uh, chapters had, and at our conference brought in speakers to talk about the variety of careers available in aviation today. So kind of another next step in planning for that uh, conference, we go to a lot of trade shows throughout the year and oftentimes people uh, will say, hey, do you have anything for my daughter or my granddaughter or my niece back home? Or sometimes even uh, depending on the event like Oshkosh, uh, young people come by the booth as well. And we would give them a copy of our magazine or, or some little trinket pen or something. We said, you know, with this program coming up in September, why don't we create a new publication? And we launched it in September last year called Aviation for Girls. And it's geared for uh, girls ages 9 to 16. Again, there's some stories about young ladies doing things in aviation, whether it's in flight or maintenance, internships, scholarships, things that are available to them that we not only give out at the Girls in Aviation Day event, but also uh, at the trade shows that we participate in. Because of the connection with the Girl Scouts and now with this broader reach with the chapters, um, the Girl Scouts of America used to have what they called an aerospace patch, which uh, for whatever reasons, faded out several years ago. And we decided to, to take the ball. There was an opportunity to create not a badge, but a patch. Uh, and we did that. And uh, at this year's conference in March, presented the first ones to the Girl Scouts who were there. And we'll be uh, through our chapter network this year, uh, our next Girls in Aviation Day event coming up September 24th, 2016. Uh, and the chapters working with Girl Scouts can use those uh, bad patches uh, as an opportunity um, for some the girls like taking those home as, as souvenirs. Uh, and if I have time, oh, sorry. <laughs> one, of our, one of our other uh, very unique programs, I think, is our um, scholarship program. And I, I applaud RAA and the, and the new foundation and the scholarships you're providing. We started our scholarship program uh, in 1995 with two $500 scholarships. And just this March, we announced in 20 years, uh, we gave away this year our 10 millionth dollar in scholarships in that 20 year history. Just at the conference alone in March, we awarded over $660,000 in scholarships to 120 some individuals. Of that number, about half, about 58, were flight related, and of that number, 15 were type ratings. So the scholarships are everything from starting your private pilot certificate, instrument ratings, multi engine, CFI, the type ratings. 
And that is one of the things we feel as an organization, you know, reaching out to youth, particularly to young ladies, to encourage them to think about aviation as a career very young and providing some resources to help them like the scholarship program. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, RAA family, no pressure, right? You all, you all know where our silent auction is uh, and how to make the donations. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very inspiring. Sharon, I'm incredibly impressed with the role. We, we talked about some of the things that you're doing, that, that you and Vaughn College are playing to help connect young people to a career through education, and particularly your support and encouragement for demographics that are not uh, traditionally represented very well in aviation today, um, women and minorities. Can you tell me how you've been effectively tapping into and more importantly supporting th these individuals? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me here, and it's great to meet Peggy, and we can talk about our Girls in Aviation okay. Day that we had three weeks ago. So we have a very active Women in Aviation chapter on campus, and um, what's unique about Vaughn, for those of you that don't know, we're located right across the street from LaGuardia Airport, so next time you fly in, um, just before you touch down, if you look out the right side of the airplane, that's us um, on the other side of the Grand Central. Queens is the most diverse county in the country, represents 120 different countries. Uh, and most of our students are not only first-generation college students, but also first-generation Americans. Uh, more than 80% are from a diverse background. And you know what's great about aviation is we have great toys. Uh, so no matter what event we have on campus, whether, and we did some Girl Scout events, and we do some Boy Scout events as well, um, it's all about putting people in sims. Uh, that really seems, and if you're good at video games, which a lot of, of the boys are in particular, um, they really enjoy the simulators. Um, so not only flight simulators, but also air traffic control simulators. We have a great tower overlooking LaGuardia Airport with the tower chatter piped in, um, so they get to hear that. And it just adds to the overall excitement. Um, but one of the biggest challenges for our students, our average family income right now is about $33,000. Um, 76% of our students are Pell eligible. That's the federal grant for the neediest students. Uh, we have one of the highest proportions in the country, not numbers wise, we're about 1,600 students, but certainly proportion wise. They're incredible, they're motivated, but they're very challenged by finances. And particularly for our pilot students, you know, where the cost of training is 60 to $70,000 on top of what they would pay in tuition, and we're very reasonable on tuition, uh, it can become a real hindrance. So we will often see students who will start in our aircraft operations program, which is our flight program, and then move to aerosciences or the airport management program um, and look at other options uh, because flight is just not an option for them uh, because of the cost. So, you know, I'm so thrilled to hear about the scholarship program and there are many organizations that are now doing scholarships and for our students, it's the difference between following and pursuing their dream and not. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that, uh, that aviation is really stepping up to provide help to those students. Yesterday, you welcomed us to Charlotte on behalf of PSA, and you shared a little bit about your cadet program and some of the efforts that you have underway to support current and future pilot staffing needs. Can you tell us a little bit more about those programs? Sure. Thanks, Faye, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, PSA is, is at, the, at the industry forefront in, uh, in growing what uh, we've labeled our cadet program. We have, uh, as the board shows here, a number of high-profile universities and flight schools across the country. Twenty-three is the number as of this morning. Um, but we have a, a distinct vision to grow that to a, a much larger community of participating programs and schools across the country. Uh, this, is, this is really uh, our way of going and, and introducing ourselves and, and the career, commercial aviation career, to aspiring pilots at, uh, at the university level. So the program uh, essentially, once a pilot gets his private pilot certificate and qualifies for uh, consideration in the program and meets our uh, requirements, they're invited to participate in the program. And as they uh, pursue their education degree and acquire hours towards their uh, total time, they are eligible for tuition reimbursement, uh, as well as other benefits, like the, uh, the uh, all uh, important flight benefits that we provide uh, for travel, as well as uh, health benefits. And so along the way, as well, while they're building their time uh, to become a certified uh, instructor with, with a qualifying thousand hours if it's a four-year university to join our airline, uh, we provide mentorship, which is a really important thing for aspiring pilots. Uh, we have uh, a pilot on uh, our staff who is dedicated to that particular university, uh, seven day a week access to the cadet to answer any questions, uh, to be there 
uh, for encouragement and uh, to share sort of a, a real life view of what their, their career means and what they're gonna encounter. Uh, they'll, they'll, th those pilots will come back on a quarterly basis to the school to do uh, one-on-ones face-to-face uh, with the students themselves. So we think that's a really important engagement opportunity. Uh, again, not only is there the financial assistance and the backing of a, of a corporation, there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a pilot who's already a number of years ahead in, in their career than the student themselves that can give a lot of context, uh, a lot of encouragement, and, and, and a lot of um, valuable information which keeps those students engaged and focused on the goal of uh, accomplishing uh, their total time equivalent to be able to join us. So we're very proud of the, the program. It's in its infancy. It's clearly something that's going to take a while to uh, develop a, a, a critical mass of pilots for us, and it's, a, it's just one but a very important component in our future recruitment. Thank you very much. I mean, it seems that that's one of many ways that we can be investing to help prevent that, uh, that leakage that Sharon mentions of the folks who start out and they want to aspire to be a pilot and then they're leaving. Ryan, can you share a little bit about Endeavor Air's experience with training pilots and tell us a little bit about your success in building De Endeavor as a pathway to Delta? Sure. Uh, we set out uh, about three years ago to start to redefine the airline uh, in our partnership with Delta Airlines uh, to build a very structured pathway uh, with the guaranteed interview program. And so we stepped backwards and, and started to mirror our processes, procedures, how we train and sort of to try to ease the, ease the transition into Delta to make sure that what we're doing on the flight deck every day mirrors what we can or what Delta does and so that, that smooths the transition. We think that's, um, we've also provided a lot of uh, interview guidance and, and preparation. We do a lot of that mentorship programs with, with Delta so that the pilots you know, feel like from day one they're, they're on this path uh, into the main line and I think that, that uh, we've seen it be very successful. Our candidates train very well with Delta, and I think we'll continue to redefine that as we move forward and build upon that because we think that's, uh, that's one of the, the biggest motivations for a pilot is to make that step into the mainline, as you said earlier. So it's a very, very good program, and we're going to continue to work on it. Okay, great. Well, that's the perfect tee up for my question for you, Steve. So you have a lot of years of flying experience. So can you offer your thoughts really in sort of a bigger picture of well-trained pilots as an industry asset? And then specifically, what does Delta look for in candidates? Sure. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, thanks, Faye, for the kind invitation. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be with everyone this morning. Um, you know, pilots are a, are a huge part of our brand uh, at Delta. And, uh, and, you know, every carrier certainly values its employees. But, but uh, you know, we see our employees uh, led by our pilots on the front line as providing uh, part of the outstanding reliability and the product that we've been able to put out there uh, in the marketplace. So we really value that. And, um, you know, in, in terms of the, uh, the pilot supply issues, you know, we actually saw this many years ago uh, when the, uh, you know, the industry's kind of been a little bit crying wolf or has been perceived as crying wolf over the years with various, you uh, uh, you know, assertions that there was going to be an impending shortage going back really to when I was still in the military 25 years ago. And through one factor or another, those, uh, you know, those things have not materialized. But as Faye said in her, in her opening remarks, you know, it's really just a matter of arithmetic right now. And, and I, the difference this time is it's not only the supply, but it's the supply in conjunction with the, the demand that's uh, just the, the demographics of an aging mainline uh, pilot workforce, of which I am certainly a part of. Uh, because we had a, a big hiring boom uh, in, the, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and then recession, uh, followed by recession, and then some growth in, in the late 90s that was cut off through uh, uh, the next recession, and then of course 9-11, the extension of the retirement age, all those things. But the bottom line is, you know, it, currently at Delta, our average age of our uh, pilots is about 53 years old, even though we have hired uh, nearly 3,000 pilots in the last three years. And uh, so it is something that, that we're seeing this, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, certainly this challenge uh, out there uh, for us. But, you know, in terms of value to the airline, you know, this is why we've partnered with Endeavor. Uh, I don't think that there is any one silver bullet that's going to solve this issue. 
uh, it's multifaceted. Uh, the solutions include uh, certainly uh, working with our regional partners in the entire regional industry uh, from a mainline uh, perspective. Right now, you know, we're not we're not in the acute phases of, of seeing the challenges uh, at Delta, and that's part of why we need to keep this at the forefront of our priorities. Uh, currently, uh, we have thousands of pilots in our competitive hiring pool. Um, we ha we're, we're pulling right now from about the top four to five percent uh, of those candidates, and so we see you know, very high quality in what we're bringing to the main line. However, those demographics, we are tending to hire um, uh, pilots who are a little bit older uh, in their career. It's understandable with uh, the natural matric matriculation did not happen either out of the military or out of the regional sector for some period of time. Part of that, again, was due to the retirement age uh, being extended. And, uh, and so that will, that will uh, come down over time, but we need to get young people uh, interested, the next generation of pilots interested. That's why uh, the outreach program. So we've got a uh, very strong partnership with Western Michigan Aviation Academy, uh, the National Flight Academy, others, uh, women in aviation. We, we uh, were face to face with more than 1,500 candidates at the last convention. Uh, other outreach programs are so important to make sure that everyone understands what the opportunities are in the industry because there are tremendous opportunities but again, those upfront costs and the uncertainty of the career path is something that we have to work together to overcome. Thank you very much. That's a very comprehensive look. Um, I, I work with a foundation in Washington, D.C., and, and we talk with kids, and a lot of them, they're really bright kids. They're STEM kids. They've had academic excellence, and they've been accepted to these fantastic colleges, um, and yet they, they come from demographics, and so they need additional support in getting there. So Sharon, this question is for you. Are there programs, and if there are not, should there be? What could we be doing um, to help some of these high school kids who have both the financial um, challenges in getting into college, but also just some of the logistical challenges in terms of making the transportation and visiting and making the transition from high school to college? Are there programs out there? It depends on the state that you're in. Um, some states are more generous than others. Um, for instance, New York is very generous with its uh, financial support to students. So um, students in New York who come from lower uh, economic backgrounds have an opportunity not only to qualify for federal grants, but also um, very generous state grants. But that varies um, by state. Um, some states are also very good about STEM specific. And of course, aviation falls into the science, technology, engineering, and math. And thankfully, there's a lot of push across the nation in terms of STEM initiatives. So there are absolutely, you just have to make that connection. Some people don't realize the connection with STEM and aviation. Um, so making that connection. Um, there's also for minority serving institutions, there's also something called Title V grants. Um, these are specifically for Hispanic serving institutions, which means that 25% or more of your population comes from a Hispanic background. That's about 36% in uh, Vaughn's case. Um, so, and they do STEM specific as well as support grants because it's not, it's not just about the, to be successful in aviation in higher education, you have to have the skills to get through the science, the math, the English, the coursework. And so you need to have the support infrastructures in place um, to make sure that they can get through those, those that coursework. Um, they generally come with the passion to do the aviation piece, but it's the support to get them to a bachelor's degree that often uh, they need. And Peggy, you're providing a lot of the support too. Um, for your organization, I, I, I said I was there, and we saw your young professionals, and you had some student networking where you're telling them how to network, and hey, if, rule number one, have a business card. <laughs> and that's really provided a lot of support. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, okay, thank you. Well, at our, our conference this year, we had uh, about 5,000 people total, and out of that number, about 450 were college and university students from over 40 uh, colleges around the, around the U.S., and we try to have something because uh, for each, and I'll use the word, uh, I'm going to steal a term here from Cassandra Bosco, uh, career uh, phases or life stages, whether you're still in a college student or the young professional, or maybe you're in your first uh, career position and you're looking for that next step, or you're mid-career, or, or maybe you're uh, retiring and enjoying that too. So we, it's, a, it's a mix of people who come to the convention, and part of the challenge too is um, those who come, some are interested or participating in whether it's general aviation, commercial airline industry, corporate aviation, or the military, and trying to address all of those different areas. So we try to put on uh, programs and events 
professional development seminars, our, our general sessions with uh, industry leader speakers. Um, and uh, Steve alluded to a minute ago, uh, the program where uh, individuals who are looking for positions, uh, companies that are hiring, and particularly uh, has been uh, focused a lot on the uh, major airlines the first year or two, but now we find we had a regional carrier this year who participated. We had some of the manufacturers who came in and participated. A chance to meet face to face for 10, 15 minute uh, times. And there, these events are going on around the country, the career fairs or whatever you want to call them. And um, we were caught a little by surprise, I think it was four years ago now. We had a few extra hundred people showing up, uh, a lot of them gentlemen in suits and ties, and we're like, this is great but why are they all here all of a sudden in <laughs> just this one year? And we're standing in line in the exhibit hall to talk to, to companies who were, uh, you know, pilot jobs were opening up. And so, ah, but that was causing problems in the exhibit hall. Other exhibitors were a little concerned uh, about this, you know, blocking their space and things. So the next year we tried to come up and be a little more um, proactive thinking, well, this is gonna happen again, and it did, and, and, and more people coming, and we came up with, you know, an area in the exhibit hall for people to sit and wait. We're talking hundreds of people. Um, and we hear that at other shows, you know, people wait six or seven hours to get a chance. We said, this is crazy. We've got to work something out um, better. Uh, we even had people sleeping in the hallway at two o'clock in the morning to get in line early to get a chance to talk to a company. So two years ago, um, we developed an electronic system where our members, people coming to the conference, could sign up ahead of time, a couple months ahead of time. Here are the companies I want to talk to, and we will assign them based on their uh, years as a member. Um, time slots to get a chance to talk. And that's growing, and that's one of the things to, to say here today. I encourage uh, those of you here with the regional carriers to come and participate. There's a lot of uh, young people uh, looking for jobs, and uh, I think you'd find that a great opportunity. One of the things that we have done to try to uh, mitigate some of that, uh, uh, you know, the mass of, of people who are showing up at, at these events uh, and we is, is by far the largest, but there are others. Uh, uh, there's uh, NGPA, there's also uh, Sun and Fun, you know, you have other, uh, other events, OBAP. Um, but uh, we have developed a team of uh, about 65 currently uh, pilot ambassadors, and we work with our uh, regional partners uh, and, and also uh, uh, our subsidiary Endeavor. We really plussed up our presence. We had we had a fairly modest presence of probably a team of maybe 15 or so folks from Delta who would participate. Now we've augmented that so that we've got the throughput uh, to be able to handle uh, the kind of face-to-face uh, -face interaction that we want to be able to have for the candidates. And I'll maybe just just add one thing. Uh, this year, I'm just checking my notes here. In 2016, there were 5,500 fast. And we call them fast passes. Yeah. You hear the term fast pass. <laughs> We were going uh, a few years ago. We were at uh, at Disney. We kind of borrowed their their uh, concept. You know, you don't want to stand. You, know, you don't want to stand in line to wait for, to go on a ride for an hour or two. And we had people sleeping on the floor waiting to get a chance to talk. So we came up with the fast pass system. Like I said it's electronic now, but but that's where the name came from. So you have 5,500 people had an opportunity for some face to face time uh, with the companies who were there. That's incredible. Okay, another question for you, Peggy, but then for everyone. I was really shocked. Last year you put out some statistics on, um, on the amount of women that are pilots. And if, if I read them right, it's just 3% of all pilots globally are women. And then in the United States, that number is much better at a little over 5%. So I, I guess why is this and, and is it changing? And I think, Dan, you showed a nice uh, video yesterday and we saw the woman, one of the first things she said is, I like this lifestyle. I like that I can live in my dome. So I, I can live in my hometown. I can live where I grew up. And, and at another conference I attended, I saw a woman say, this is great. I went to a preschool um, and they said, oh, we thought you were a stay at home mom. We had no idea because I'm able to be there so much. So clearly some of the lifestyle factors that might be the precluding factors uh, may not be what they are. So I guess it's a long way of saying, you know, is it still a problem? Have we changed it? And are we articulating all the great advantages a pilot career has for women? I would just say that um, the, the U.S. Uh, total is, is around 6%, six percent, um, and, and it stayed, it's been that way for, for many years, but the encouraging news is, if you look at the number of women who have obtained commercial pilot certificates, ATP mm -hmm. certificates, those are the numbers that have increased substantially. In fact, from 2010 to 2016, uh, that number increased by um, eight, 8%. Eight so the total number of women earning uh, the ATP ratings is, is increasing. And if you go back 21 years, 
that number was less than 1%. So it is still a small percentage, but the actual numbers are increasing and, and we still have more to do. But I think you're right, getting the message out about the career, what that means, the, the flexibility, I think would be uh, a, an enticement. So I sit on the International Aviation Women's Association Advisor Board. We had an event last week in New York City, um, particularly featuring women in aviation. So we had the first female pilot, uh, Bonnie Taberzi Caputo. Uh, we had um, a VP for sales, uh, Mary Ellen Jones, who's also currently the Wings Club, uh, the New York Aviation Club president. Um, first one, second one we've ever had in our history, um, second one in 15 years. And um, lots of folks, and the woman who moderated was an F-18 pilot from the military, and she looked about 22, she was amazing. Um, and it was really inspiring to have a group of women sort of from across the, the spectrum of aviation and aerospace talking about um, how things have changed. We still have work to do, um, but that there are opportunities for women and more all the time as they're starting to see occasionally all women female crews and um, you know now we have International Women's Day and in the aviation community you often see lots of pictures of all female uh, crews, which is terrific, um, and it was just really inspiring to see how these women have really been able to achieve something significant in aviation, um, and the, the opportunities are growing. For the airlines, are you doing anything to recruit more women or to support those women that are in your ranks? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, Endeavor, you know, we look at it a little more holistically, not just on the pilot ranks, because we see it across all the way from corporate to any, any part of the airline. Um, we we really try to put a lot more female presence on our recruiting teams because we feel like that that bridges the allows for better conversations sometimes it's not as approachable to go to Steve even though Steve's a great approachable guy it's better to have a, a female sometimes to go talk to so um, we've looked at that we've also established a corporate um, committee type uh, structure where we've got females that sit on and, and talk about not only how do we recruit but how do we uh, promote advancement throughout the organization to make sure that the, those opportunities are there that that people see that you know that there's pathways to the, to the top of the organization so um, a lot of different fronts that we're working on to, to try to encourage them yeah and at PSA we uh, I, I'm proud very proud to say that uh, probably the most important person uh, in our organization um, is happens to be uh, a female and her name's Val Zimmerman Captain Val Zimmerman she heads our uh, recruiting uh, pilot recruiting workforce and uh, an incredibly capable person with a, with a military background started with PSA on the ground handling side of the business and decided that she wanted to be a pilot and uh, um, became a Czech airman and, and, and eventually uh, leads now our pilot recruitment workforce. And she's an incredibly skilled, energetic person and, and someone that we couldn't uh, have been more fortunate to have in that role. Um, very effective person out front. Uh, we know that when Val is successful in recruiting uh, female pilots, those female pilots will probably be the first ones that are hand selected by majors. Um, and they'll spend a, a shorter tenure with PSA. We're happy to see that happen, uh, quite frankly. And uh, again, uh, my, my, my kudos to Val and leading the team in pursuit of, of all pilots, but uh, female pilots as well. And a s similar uh, with, uh, with Delta, and among those uh, ambassadors that I talked about before, we have a significant contingent of, uh, of female captains and first officers who are right out front you know, in, in, that, in that group. Um, Currently, we are interviewing and hiring uh, female pilots at about twice the rate of our existing complement. We work very hard to, uh, uh, to make sure there are opportunities. Uh, having said that, we want to make sure that you know, the interview uh, standards and the selection process is the same for everyone. And so we don't want to set anyone up for failure when they come in uh, to the interview process. But we do have, through our pre-screening, uh, the ability to be able to identify outstanding candidates uh, because we place a very high premium on leadership. Uh, you know, I tell our new hires, uh, and actually we tell in the selection process, we're not hiring pilots at Delta, we're hiring captains uh, because we place a very high um, priority on uh, leadership, decision making, customer service. You know, if you look at what's happened with technology at the front end of the airport and even in the boarding process, over the last decade, pilots are a much larger portion of the public contact uh, employees that we have at the airline. And um, a lot of times, you know, we, we don't really want pilots who view their job as just flying passengers from point A to point B. 
Uh, we need leaders who can solve problems. Uh, 3,200 flights a day, a million flights a year. I can't write a write a, uh, a procedure for every scenario that they're going to encounter. So we want uh, folks who are team players, understand how to be leaders in a large organization. Um, and those are the kind of attributes uh, that we look for. And there are ways when you look at someone's experience, the accomplishments that they've had outside of flying, those are the kind of people that we want to bring on board. And we're, and we're finding a lot of success finding those among our, our female candidates. I will say um, with the, the flying job at a, at a commercial carrier, yes, there is a lot of flexibility, but at times, and anyone who's been a line pilot understands this, at times we actually make the job a little more difficult than it has to be. Uh, there's a trade-off between flying what, what you can, uh, you know, the sort of the highest paying piece of equipment versus being able to control your schedule. And to the extent that uh, someone with a family, whether they be male or female, has young children in school or a military service commitment or something uh, you know, in their life that's outside of, of the airline, those are, are uh, big parts of the trade-off. And if, if, um, if those things get out of balance, that's where it can be a little bit challenging. That's very interesting. So I have one more moderated question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience for a couple of questions. So I showed the slide earlier when I said, uh, you know, we, we're really reaching out to the millennials using these generationally relevant tools. And I was on one of my speaking jaunts uh, over the past couple of months, and I started to leverage that slide and talking about how we're engaging in social media. And I got cut off mid-sentence, and somebody says, look, if you want to reach the millennials, you got to reach their parents. So uh, what can we do to get the parents? I mean, is that, first of all, is it true? Because I'm not sure that it is. I think we're inspiring some folks, but I think there, there probably is some truth to the fact that we've got to give, increase the comfort level for the parents. So what are we doing and what more can we do to engage with the students and their parents that are coming in? For anyone, really. Well, that, that's a great question. I think it, it absolutely is right. If you think about the cost of an education and, and, and the, the prohibitively high cost of training, uh, with the current rule set that's in place now, um, any parent should be gravely concerned if their child chooses, you know, commercial aviation um, and, and goes to a four-year school. And w with the, the, the structure that we've put in place um, at TSA in connection with American, we think that uh, we, we afford parents uh, a great deal of comfort if, uh, if, if their child does pursue an aviation career. If you think back to this cadet uh, program that we're setting up, um, as, as a prospective pilot picks the, the university or school that they're going to go to, uh, obviously there's likely to be parental involvement in that decision-making process. It's great to be able to be part of that uh, as, as, a, as a regional carrier and be able to represent not only are you picking a quality school, it's a school that we've chosen as one to partner with, but we as a, a carrier who will provide your, your, your student pilot and, and, and daughter or son uh, assistance along the way, also have a flow-through program to the world's largest carrier. So uh, in choosing the program and choosing the quality school, you're also choosing a career path for your son or daughter that will eventually culminate in them flying uh, you know, 787 to Shanghai. That's a great level of comfort and security. Uh, and those are two words that you didn't often and haven't regularly found used to describe an aviation career. And so we very much um, uh, have structured it that way so that it can be compelling to the parents and, and hopefully can resonate and draw more uh, students into the, into the field. Great. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, I think um, parents today are looking at the value of the education and what is the return. And I think that we've got to focus on reducing the barriers of, of entry into this, this field, especially on the pilot side. Um, the gap, the broken, the pipeline gap. I think when parents look at the degree field and think, you know, it's one of the only uh, degrees out there where you can go through the entire program, but you're still yet not qualified to to go to work in, in the regional airline business. So that that gap, I think, is it weighs a lot on on parents' minds about do I make this investment or do I steer my child into something else that has a more defined uh, uh, exit point. And, and so I think, you know, we've we've got to do better at uh, these the restrictive pathways and reconnecting the pipeline so that there's the push of this this doesn't make sense and I want to spend my money and, and put them in in that program. So we we hear that and when we're out visiting the schools, we we fly airplanes in. We actually have the parents. We focus on the parents coming onto the airplanes and and talking to them about all the great programs, even the stuff that Dion's talking about um, in the career field. 
but we get the question a lot of, well, how are, how are they going to get from University of North Dakota to you? And that, that, that's a great question, and I think it's... This is the hard part of the conversation is, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to leave us and go make $20 an hour as a flight instructor until you can get to 1,000 hours if they graduate for a Bachelor of Science degree because we're part 141 and have the RATP. Um, and somehow you're supposed to make that work until mm -hmm. you get called up. Right, right. So that's the, at least somebody else is paying for your flight time. Um, that's what I try Hopefully. to sell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we'll equate it to medical school. I mean, that's a right. big, <laughs> but it's very similar in that you're going to have to continue to make some investment or not see a huge return until you get to, you know, until you get to that better paying job. Um, but I do think we have to be really focused on outcomes. I mean, that's true for higher education. That's true for aviation. We have to show people, um, you know, this is what the placement rate looks like. This is what the job salary looks like. Um, this is the kind of lifestyle you're going to be able to enjoy. And to have people that look like them. So having, you know, a Camilla Turrieta who's, who's flying right now. She's a Vaughn graduate who flies for Republic, right? Having her featured and seeing, you know, she looks like me. I can do that, right? I think that's, it's really important to have the models and the numbers so that people can have something to grab onto, both the students and the parents. I think well, there's also, um, not, there's, there's many barriers to entry, and I think as an industry, we need to begin to look at how do we reduce the cost of flight training at, at, at the beginning level? So how do we use our buying power, our leverage to lower fuel costs, insurance hall, uh, insurance rates, ways to reduce that to make sure that we are you know, making it as smooth and as easy of a, of a transition through the entire path, so. Yeah, I think removing barriers is important, but it's not gonna be enough. I think that it's, it's gonna have to be, a, first of all, the entire industry has gotta be focused upon this, and when I say the industry, I'm including the military, because I think ultimately, this could be a national security issue. Um, there are some things that the military needs to do uh, to make the career, frankly, more attractive, because they're facing some of the same issues and we're competing for the same uh, people uh, in many respects. So uh, there are things that, uh, you know, we've got this shared resource between our guardsmen and reservists. Uh, that takes a little bit of pressure off of our regional partners. You know, we can't afford, even if we were to hire every, every pilot or a regional carrier right now, um, you put the numbers up, it wouldn't be enough. You know, we need about 25,000 in the next decade. There are only about 18,000 in total. And some of those are in that 50 to 59 demographic that, you know, are, are, are probably not going to uh, be at a major carrier. So I think it's a combination of reducing barriers, but also putting some structure in place that doesn't currently exist. Uh, that's where the active recruiting comes in place, uh, into, into play the uh, uh, outreach to parents. But it's got to be sustained over a period of time. It can't be flavor of the month. Uh, type of thing. It's got to be a coordinated uh, industry solution that we've that we've got to put in place. And I think we've got to bring the military into the conversation. Um, you know, right now the Air Force is paying $250,000 bonuses to incentivize uh, pilots to stay beyond 10 years. And, and they're having trouble attracting uh, pilots into, into the military because of the 10-year active duty service commitment. If that were only five years, and then there were an opportunity to go into, uh, say, a guard or reserve commitment of maybe 15 years or, or 10 years beyond that, then they can get their seniority uh, number at a carrier and continue that aspect of their career. There are multiple uh, things that we need to be able to do, partnering on training, uh, all those kind of things that can reduce the cost of, of getting in and, and removing some of those barriers. That's right, and to your point about the military, one of the things that the pilot source study looked at when they looked at where our, our, our pilot, how our pilots perf were performing in training was their background, and it just happened to capture something that we are drawing increasingly from the military as well. I think as you see those regional airlines starting salaries really increasing, we start to be more competitive draw as well, so we've been engaging in that space too. Um, I'm going to open it up for two audience questions, and then I have a few more on the training side. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Peggy. Address the question with maybe a little different perspective. One of the things we are asked a lot, well, why aren't you know, the more women in aviation, how do we get more, more girls interested? And one of the things we've talked about, you know, reaching them at a younger age, even at age eight and nine, and certainly by middle school and so forth. Um, and the parent participation is, is very important uh, for the buy-in, if you will, particularly, I think, 
for the young ladies. And the parents who come to these events, they get all excited too, and, and they think it's pretty cool that their, uh, their daughter or granddaughter is interested. But another important aspect, I think, you know, we all know the opportunities in aviation are there. The doors are open, and we're encouraging women to consider these careers. But reaching out to the parents, because there's still, I think, we, the parents who tend to, to gear sons and daughters into various career options based on, on their thoughts and, the, and their background, but also for the high school guidance counselors. And one of the things we're doing in July this year is participating at the American Society of um, High School Counselors, participating in having a, an aviation theme, participating in a panel presentation, trying to get the word out to the guidance counselors too that career opportunities in aviation are there for, for men and women. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. We'll be there too. Oh, good. Uh, we're participating in that. And I think that's a wonderful thing. We had a bunch of, of pilots come in and talk with us. Uh, well, we had a bunch of aviation from the University Aviation Association that came in and they bring their, pi their, their um, students in every year. And I asked how many of your pilots and actually got a, a pretty good amount of hands that went up. I said, how, how did you get into it? Where did you hear about it? Not one of them said from my guidance counselor. So I think that's a really important point. Okay, we had a number of hands go up in the audience. If I could ask you to just, before you start, announce who you are and your background for our panelists. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Catherine Creedy. I'm with Forbes Online. Um, a couple of things on the women in aviation. Two things uh, I noticed on the floor. Crew Outfitters has a um, uh, uniform for pregnant pilots. <laughs> And Frontier Pilots are now suing the airline because they want breastfeeding rights. <laughs> so <laughs> things have changed. Um, if you could go quickly through your top, since you're on the front lines talking to the young people, uh, what are the top like myths that you hear from parents and their children on how tough it is to get or uh, about a piloting career or a maintenance technician career? So generally, <laughs> So in a lot of cases, there's a couple of different ways that students come to us. One is they have somebody in their family, right, who took them to the airport and they sat on the hood of the car and watched the planes take off. Um, and then in some cases, it's the student all by themselves who's really motivated. Nobody in their family is connected to aviation. I typically ask that it's an open house, how'd you get interested? And I get a lot of, I'm the only one. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, having resources available online, <coughs> excuse me, that can help students plug into aviation careers, and often they don't know anything besides pilot and a maintenance technician, right? So one of the jobs we have is to try to help them understand about the vast, I mean, you can do just about anything in aviation, um, and yet they tend to think just in those sort of siloed areas. So part of our job is to sort of give them a sense of all the different aspects that they can do. Myths. Not so much, you know, we have a very, um, I think because we're known primarily as an aviation institution, people come to us somewhat informed already. They don't, the only piece that we will often get is they don't understand the, the pilot pipeline, right? So how much is it gonna cost me? That's probably the biggest one. Um, and, and the parents are, you know, they go bug-eyed when I say 60 to 70,000. Um, and for some parents, they come in knowing that, but for a lot of them, they don't understand that piece. And then they, they typically don't understand the new rule in terms of the number of flight hours that they need. I mean, we can make a very good case because of our designation with the RATP and the Part 141 that you're gonna get some bonus hours, but wait, I have to do what after that? I mean, so there is very much a confusion about the pipeline. It's not so much a myth, but they just don't understand what it takes to get I can't just go apply, when I'm done here, I can't just go apply for a job at Delta, <laughs> so. Any other myths that you could think of? Somebody give, somebody give Catherine a myth. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this qualifies as a, as a myth. I think it's, uh, and we've alluded to it up here, it's that uh, fam unless you've had someone in your family who ha is, has worked in our industry, uh, you know, my father was an Air Force pilot, um, you know, so, I don't know whether I would have considered the career back back in the day if he hadn't had that experience. Um, so if, if if you don't have someone in your family or someone in your world who shows you what the opportunity can be and walks you through that, um, you just don't really see it. And that's what we see in a lot of our outreach programs is families don't understand that this is an opportunity for them. And there is tremendous opportunity. It's not uh, a real clean path from here to there like going to medical school or, or, uh, or, or uh, another profession, 
but there, uh, and that, that's what we've been talking about here this morning. But I think it's just really not understanding what the opportunity is and that it really is now uh, for a lot of young people. There's another uh, uh, question in the audience. Good morning. My name's uh, William Bennett, a proud 14-year captain at Republic Airlines. We've talked a lot this week about getting new people into regional aviation. What can we do better to keep people in regional aviation? I'm a 14-year captain that's got in, er, applications out everywhere, but I like what I do. What can we do better to keep people in the seats that we've already paid to train them to do? So, great, I'm gonna lead off. I mean, Endeavor's been pretty aggressive on lots of different fronts. I think we, we talk a lot about pay, and the pay has increased, and we've got great packages, you know, um, but I think we miss some of the quality of life uh, enhancements that we've made and they sort of get you know put behind the shadows of the twenty thousand dollar bonuses or, or retention bonuses but there's a lot of movement going on if you look in into the the details of the quality of life advancements that have taken place such as commuting uh, you know host of work rules that to try to get more time at home and, and so I think those are the areas that we focus on I think um, from a quality standpoint our operation um, knowing that you're going to come to work and you're going to have a good, you know, clean, reliable airplane and you're going to finish your trip at the end of the trip and you're going to go home is, is a huge improvement as well that our, our crews have seen. So I think um, no doubt across the board improving the regional airlines uh, from, from the work experience to the culture to, um, to, to advancement opportunities if you want, but if not making it a great place to, to end a career. We have a lot of pilots that do that. We've, we've got a lot of pilots at the top of our seniority list that don't want to move to Delta. They don't want to go sit reserve in New York on the on the narrow body fleet. They're happy doing what they're doing. And so we, we are continuing to focus on that group of pilots to try to improve our airline to make sure that it's it's a great career place for them to end their career there if that's what they want. We, we love to keep them on the experience side. We need the mentorship. We need the training capabilities. And I think they, they bring a great piece to our airline. Um, and so we, we are very focused on that very issue. It's not all about moving, moving you in and moving you out. We, we have that opportunity as well, but we, we like to focus on that, that top percent of our, our workforce to, to ensure that we've got the right tools in place to continue our, our great, great quality and, and customer service. Yep. I think, uh, you know, Ryan hit a lot of it. There's a lot of uh, value in just being on a winning team. And, uh, you know, people want to be part of, part of a winner, and that means running a good operation, uh, putting a great product out there, and being recognized for, for uh, you know, for what you're contributing to the success of the enterprise. And so yes, while, while, uh, while pay and, and uh, compensation, quality of life, that's all important, but I think being part of a winner is important as well and, and v just valuing that. Um, and I had a recent experience uh, we have uh, during uh, the end of our uh, uh, indoctrination period, the first two weeks uh, before the uh, new hire pilots go into the training program. We do a dinner for them in the museum, fly their families in and everything. And uh, I had a, a female new hire pilot who was uh, coming to us from Sky West uh, and her husband was a Sky West captain about 15 or 16 years. And he has an application in at the, at the majors, but I was talking to him and you know, he likes what he does. And uh, you know he's he's very successful. He's living in the uh, domicile where he's currently based up in the Twin Cities, and life is good. And uh, so you know I think that those are the kind of things that you know we 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 look at this. You know you can't just look at the arithmetic. You know all of the we have to uh, have uh, uh, viable partners. You know the mainline carriers aren't going to be flying into Albany, Georgia. You know, we are, and, and we actually need to, uh, you talked about the reduction in service in some of the cities around the country. You know, our networks rely on, and our, our economy relies on being able to provide service to um, a lot of those communities. And the regional carriers are gonna be, are gonna be providing that. So we need to make sure that that's uh, uh, an extremely valued part of the career as well. Okay. I'm gonna open it up again to some of the audience questions, but I have two questions that I wanna ask. Um, really in unison, and, and this goes more toward the, I talked about the deteriorated pool of the candidates out there, and this is something that we've talked around with the, the board table about and our training departments to see it. We've now seen this empirical evidence 
The REA has a plan. So Ryan, I'm gonna start with you. Can you walk us through sort of what the evolution was of the restricted ATP program? What are its objectives and what are the types of, of things that it involves that will really increase the proficiency of pilots? Uh, sure, we, uh, you know, it's been since 2013 at Endeavor, we started to see a degradation of our, our candidates coming into the airline, which was sort of contrary to what you would think the rule would have created. So we really started to, to drill down and with the training folks and, and we started to, to figure out where, what, what was driving this, this change. And we, we started to see that the gap between um, where, where they're really hands on the controls in that training, that academia environment to when we were getting them, there was a degradation of skills. And, and so we sat down and said, we've got to figure out a better way to, to create this. And we partnered with Delta Airlines. A lot of great people came together to sit in a room and, and started to brainstorm what, what w would a program look like. And um, focused on the training side, we also focused on the data side. So we, we've got a lot of sophistication in our, our airlines. We're able to track and trend data down to uh, pilot performance that would tell us to dry, you know, how to adjust our training for what we're seeing on, on, on the line. And we, we put a lot of different things, mentorship, screening requirements, uh, extra training, uh, not, not just training, um, you know, we didn't want to leave anything to chance on, an, on the experiential side. So we focused a lot on, on what they would see on the line. So coming from a, a flight training environment, uh, college level to making that transition to the airline. So ATC environments, weather, high altitude operations, Air, advanced aerodynamics, we put that into the program to ensure that they had the right foundation. And then once they had that foundation, we made sure that we uh, increased different parts of the simulator experience to account for actual receiving ATC clearances, how to talk on the radio. So a lot, lot more focused on what they're going to see when they get on, on the flight line. And then we put in the data, the data part of how are they performing and what can we adjust on the training to make sure that they, they retain and, and stay as proficient as we need them to stay all the way through the, the transition to the removal of the restricted ATP. So it's a very advanced program that we feel advances safety and puts us on the path that, that not only reconnects the pipeline but advances safety, as I said. So it's, um, it's, that's the overview in a nutshell. <laughs> And Dean, were you seeing that same with your recruiting? Were you seeing a deteriorated pool of candidates? Yeah, we are. I mean, we, we've seen uh, a, a number of things. Um, I probably described it, want to stay away from stereotypes, but the, the, the rule has certainly invited people back to aviation that have been away from it for a very long time. And again, you know, they may have accumulated hours, but we, we look at that as, you know, relevant hours. How, how recent was it? How applicable was it? Uh, if you flew cargo 14 years ago and had, you know, 29,000 hours, in a you know well-developed career, but you're you, you're not necessarily a great pilot, and the footprint of training shows us that that is uh, an area of concern that we had to focus on. So, uh, we, like uh, Ryan just alluded to, we've made adjustments in our training program to uh, identify the most qualified candidates, not based upon hours, but based upon relevant training experience, um, and then along the training footprint at TSA as well, we've uh, instituted. A number of additional um, incremental steps, uh, more use of, of uh, class four IPT type um, involvement before they go to the simulator, and um, and enhanced uh, our, our our training as well for that purpose. So yes, we have seen a, a difference in, in the profile of folks coming to us, and and again are just not satisfied that hours are a good representation of of qualification in any way. So uh, let, let's, let's tackle a difficult subject. And we always have a lot of representation um, from our uh, employee partners here in organized labor. So I'm sure there's some of you in the room. And I hope that the, the trend and the theme of this convention and this panel has been investment, an incredible investment that's made. And I think an important part of that is the relationship between um, the management and the employee partners and the organized labor. When I was younger, I had a neighbor who worked for Eastern Airlines. And after that protracted dispute and uh, what, what happened, you know, the kids of, of that family were just completely deterred away from aviation. How much of that, how much of these sort of protracted labor disputes do you think is influential in, you know, another barrier of entry for the people coming in? And, and if it's a fact, how do we move away from this us versus them? Steve, you said, you said that you know, we're on a winning team together. And I think that really articulates it. How can we be a team? We are all in this together. We're trying to, to do the right things. 
um, together so we have a strong airline for our passengers and our employees. So what are some of the steps that you're taking at Delta? We'll start with you and then any of the, the airlines could, could comment on that. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, what we've seen uh, is that, you know, our uh, employees uh, really are a key part of the value proposition uh, at the airline. You know, we all fly the, you know, uh, the same equipment. You know, we have different networks and, and somewhat different uh, business models in some cases. But uh, the customers remember who they interact with. And uh, so employees can really be a big part of, and, th and they are certainly at Delta, uh, a big part of our success. And so the question is, among all of our stakeholders, uh, whether it's the communities that we serve, uh, again, our employees, uh, our owners, um, you know, uh, the need to invest capital in the product, we've just got to be balanced in our approach. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a win-win uh, solution out there. Um, you know, we're very proud of Delta for ex our only um, uh, large union workforces with our pilots. I mean, we're in uh, negotiations right now on a new contract, and we generally have been able to settle these over the last 15 years uh, before the amenable date of the contracts. And, um, you know, right now we're, uh, we're uh, uh, basically uh, in an, uh, another expedited process to try to move uh, towards uh, a new contract at Delta Airlines that will position us for the future. And I think that if you look at uh, pilots and long-term employees in particular, uh, the interests of the airline in terms of being successful and the interest of the uh, individual pilot uh, and, and all of our employees are really tied to, uh, very uh, inextricably together. Uh, because if the airline is successful and is able to take advantage of opportunities in the marketplace uh, and able to be a, a strong competitor, then that's more opportunity uh, for the individual careers. And so that's how, that's how we think of it. Uh, you know, variable compensation uh, 10 years ago was thought of as something that wasn't uh, a big part of the value proposition. It was all about pay rates. Uh, but we found that, uh, again, as we've been able to have some success over the last few years, the role of variable compensation and um, partic in particular profit sharing, but also uh, operations bonuses for uh, on-time completion factor, baggage performance, uh, when you're consistently earning those kinds of rewards, when you set very challenging goals coming into the year, everyone gets a lot of satisfaction out of that. It's part of, part of that winning culture. Yeah, I think Steve's right. It's, it's culture. It's about, um, you know, being on, being on the winning team. I think, I think what we look at at Endeavor, we see our relationships with our organized labor as, as a resource, and maybe it's my pilot background. It's, it's, I look at as a leader of the organization, I've got to utilize all available resources. We don't have all the answers all the time, and they sometimes they bring a great perspective, and so we have very close relationships with our organized labor. Um, they bring us a perspective. We appreciate that. We, we work together as a business partner, and I think that's what makes our airline successful, and that's what's made us be able to set some of the operational records we've been able to do is our, our frontline people having the right tools and right resources. And I think that takes everybody at the airline coming together and, and bouncing ideas around and, and talking through things and working it out. And, and it, it, it's, in my mind, it, it is what has made us successful is, is our relationship with, with those, those stakeholders, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I think these guys have, have, have said it very well. I, I, we view it the same way, which is uh, the, the, the relationship with our union is a critically important one because, quite frankly, um, they carry a lot of weight with the membership and, and how they view uh, their, you know, their airline is very impactful on the, the way the membership uh, views it as well. And um, we strive to, to create that transparency and that, and that trust um, at, the, at the management and, and union leadership level. I think what's at the basis of it is, is, is just transparency. As, as Ryan mentioned, it, this is a logistics business and it's not going to be graceful at any moment uh, or at every moment. Um, the issue is how do you resolve those and how do you structurally address them so that you can, can produce a, a reliable product. Everybody does want to be part of something that works and works well, particularly those that, like the speaker said yesterday, when, when you value the customers on your aircraft and, and their individuality and what they bring to that travel experience. You want to do your best. Uh, you want to be part of an airline operation that is set up for success so that when you do your job, everything goes well. So that's very important to put those investments in place. At PSA, we're, we're growing very, very fast and growing from a small, uh, you know, really 
uh, small 49 airplane airline to 107 airplanes as of today. We're making huge investments in technology and communication, uh, means by which we can do our jobs better and help our crew members and help their leadership, um, who represents them, uh, see what, what we're after here, uh, which ultimately is good customer service. And then on the other end, uh, you know, I can't, I can't um, understate the value of, of the flow agreement that we have with American. We realize that the vast majority of pilots that do come to us, uh, this is a stop along the way in their career path, and they do uh, want to end up as, at a mainline carrier. Or, um, and so having that agreement or with, with American and, and flowing our pilots on to, uh, to, to the world's largest carrier, which by the way pays, pays the highest wages as the world's biggest network, <laughs> that is a really compelling proposition. It's our obligation, our duty with, with that union leadership to make the opportunities at TSA for folks who join us as, as rewarding as they can be while they're on their way to, 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 to eventually where they want to go. And that highlights an important source of support. The unions are providing that for pilots as well. And so a uh, slightly different angle on that question for Peggy and Sharon, but are you interfacing with the pilot unions? And I know that they're at Women in Aviation, so what kind of programs are you working on with some of the supports that a pilot will continue to have throughout his or her professional career? We're not actively engaged with any pilot unions, like I said, you know, participation, but at this point, there's not any. Yeah. Oh, we'd be happy to. <laughs> engagement as well and I think that's that that you all can play a really really important role in reaching out and inspiring and I think the more opportunities that we can engage um, with those partners and not just at the airline level but the at the association level are really important are there we have time for uh, one or two last questions in the audience good morning uh, I'm Joe Vasquez I'm the national commander of the Civil Air Patrol which is the uh, auxiliary United States Air Force and one of the things that um, is, I have a question regarding the pipeline itself. CAP is actually um, working on the, how shall I say, the young end of the pipeline, because we deal with, uh, through our aerospace education program, uh, K through 12 students, we impact upwards of 150,000 a year in that program alone, but in particular, 23,000 cadets, ages 12 through 20. And we're looking at the possibility of starting up, and in fact, we I shouldn't say possibility, we are starting up a private pilot scholarship program for our cadets. And we want to bring them up to at least a private pilot level free of charge through these scholarships. And my question is, you know, we've built the pipeline up at least that far. And I, I also should point out of our 23,000 cadets, about 20% are female. So we're hoping that to get a large percentage of our cadets into maybe the airline industry. So what can we do to connect our pipeline with maybe your pipelines to bring them actually into an airline career? I, I think it may make sense. Yeah, the question makes Cohen, you tie into the university, right? I mean, I, I, I'm glad you stood up and had a question because I was going to bring up Civil Air Patrol earlier. It, it just seems like there's an incredible opportunity there that we can reconnect with. I actually got some of my interest from Civil Air Patrol and aviation, so uh, it's incredibly valuable. And I think um, from the airline standpoint, we, we would love to connect more with the Civil Air Patrol, providing opportunities, uh, similar like internships. I remember we did two-week deployments in the summer. Uh, to mainly military bases, but there's no reason why you couldn't tie that to maybe an airline or, or look at it from there, but I think maybe backing up to the university. Civil Air Patrol meets on our campus, right? So having our doors open, making our facilities open, you know, allowing them sim time, um, and certainly being connected to our career services and pieces like that. Um, we're already doing some of those things. So it'll, it's terrific that you're going to support to the private pilot because, you know, that's ten to 12000 of that sixty to $70,000 nut. So thank you. And then we also have, with our chapter network, we have chapters who work with um, Civil Air Patrol units. If there's one in their area, we also, with the Aviation Explorer program through the Boy Scouts of America. So there's an opportunity there potentially as well. For the, the airlines to help with the scholarship programs as well. I mean, I think that, that we would be incredibly interested in that. So yeah, I great. think this was uh, what we were talking about earlier. I think it really addresses two issues, is uh, uh, young people understanding what the opportunity is and also uh, that it's not going to be enough to bring barriers down. We have to put some structure in place and some coordinated activity in place that doesn't currently exist among many segments of the industry, and I think you've given us a great example. 
I greatly appreciate that you raised that. Um, the Civil Air Patrol is something that we've gotten a little bit more involved with as an association as well. And just as an aside, um, one of my colleagues, Stacey Bechtel, has been heavily involved. And uh, she's ascended to, I believe, the board of directors. So um, that investment is very important. So I encourage all of you to, to continue to make it. So we're, we're getting to the close of what's been a really great panel. Go ahead, Ryan. Got a question on okay, I, we're gonna take one more quick question and then we've got a lightning round of, of questions here at the, at the close of the panel. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Good morning, Sam Poole, chairman of the Envoy Alpa chapter. Uh, so I guess I'm part of the labor that you were speaking of. Um, sure seems like the people in this room are given a large responsibility by the major brands. 46% of departures, I think you said earlier. Um, yet you do it under intense downward economic pressure. Uh, to the point where the career is economically unviable for the labor side. Um, what responsibility do the major brands have to help alleviate this issue amongst the members of the RAA? I, I mean, our, our relationship with Delta, um, they're, they're incredibly involved. So uh, not just because they're sitting on the panel here, but, um, you know, they've allowed us to, to deploy the tools that we've made, and we've been very aggressive in compensation, work rules, changes, because as I said earlier, when you look at just the bonuses and all the things that make the headlines, that's just a drop in the bucket compared to the investments when you make into the actual career, the, the quality of life advancements and all the things that we're doing. And so our partner is very engaged, and they are – um, we, we have these conversations regularly. How can we make it better? I think that we're going to continue to do that, and so I, I, I'll let you no, take I mean, on that. I think that's exactly right. I mean, the, the, the um, you know, it's our brand, right? So the, those are Delta passengers that are on Endeavor and all of our regional affiliates. So it's in our interest to make sure that we make the kind of investments that we've been talking about here to make sure that the that the career path is, is a viable and sustainable uh, career path. So, um, you know, I think that there's been growing awareness of this, frankly, over the years. One of the challenges that we've had is that, you know, this, the, the acute shortage has not hit the majors yet. And um, so, you know, those of us who have seen it coming for a number of years have kind of been trying to put, push the rock up the hill. Well, now guess what? You know, we're, you know, we're there and we see what's on the other side. So I think it's going to have to be sustained work. We're going to have to look at, again, some of that structure where it doesn't currently exist. Um, you know, certainly compensation, uh, mitigations for training expense. You know, a lot of the th tools that we've talked about today uh, will, uh, will certainly make the, the pipeline more viable and attractive, and the majors need to be involved with that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so this has been a, the, a really fantastic panel. And so, again, I invited you all here because I am truly inspired by the work that you're doing and the investments that you are personally making in helping to make this a more attractive and just fantastic career path and telling people about it. So let's close on that. What is your message to young people, and how, how do you encourage them when they grow up to consider a, a, a career in aviation? I'll start with you, Peggy. Uh, I think the message to young people is that there are so many uh, wonderful opportunities in aviation to take the time to explore them. And somebody mentioned earlier, not just maybe the traditional pilot mechanic, but there's a, a lot of opportunities. You can be in aviation and be an, an, an accountant or a lawyer or a doc. I mean, there's all, all kinds of ways to be involved. And just uh, sharing that, that message and the, the excitement, the passion we all have for aviation. Yeah, and I think my message would be no matter your background, no matter where you come from, there's an institution that can help you if your dream is to be in this field. So I've been in commercial aviation for 23 years, and the amount of change that I've seen is just enormous. Um, I really do think we're, we're at a point now where we have a restructured U.S. commercial aviation business that affords stability that we haven't seen in, in over two decades. Um, the, the career path opportunities for aspiring pilots now is brighter than it ever has been before. We need to unshackle the myth uh, if there is a myth that this is not a career that you should invest in, um, that we need to remove the barriers to entry that are long training and expensive uh, investments to get started. Uh, and as we do that, it will only uh, increase the value of a career. It's still one that is fueled by passion and fueled by an interest, in, uh, a human interest in serving others and taking care of people. And, and that'll never change and it can move people around the world. So those three components together, I think, um, need to be you know, put in front of people and, and, and remind them what a wonderful, valuable, and now more than ever lucrative career it represents. Yeah, I mean, Dion hit it well. I mean, it's a great career and it's gonna continue to, to 
get better. And um, I mean, just the opportunities that you have uh, in the flexibility, the great equipment you get to fly, the advancements that are coming, uh, it's definitely uh, very attractive. Uh, and I think it's going to continue to get more attractive. I think removing the barriers are, is incumbent upon all, on all of us as leaders, so everybody in this room. I think we're going to continue to do that. We'll, we'll overcome the challenges. I'm, 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 you know, sure of that because I think we've got probably the most talent in the world when it comes to the aviation industry, and we'll we'll work through this, and we'll reconnect those pipelines. And 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 um, it's a great career field. So I just I don't want to lose. Sometimes I think we lose that. Uh, as a leader, leadership, we focus on the issues and we tend to talk about the issues and that sort of gets radiated out and we miss that this is a great career field. It's, it's improving every day and I think it's going to continue to do that. So. You know, I think Dion actually hit an important point here. The, uh, you know, I think the best days of our industry are, are still ahead of us. Uh, if you look at what's happened over the past uh, 25, 30 years, it's really just the path since deregulation with some uh, bumps in the road, uh, certainly economically and, and with the 9-11 uh, tragedy that have uh, interrupted, uh, you know, the growth of the industry. But now uh, we've got a solid uh, network base and uh, we're 7% of the U.S. economy and a very valuable and actual economic asset. And I think that there's, a, there's just tremendous opportunity uh, in our industry ahead. I think our best days are ahead of us. Well, thank you very much. So certainly incredible challenge, but also incredible opportunity. So I appreciate everything that you're doing. And please, as we close out this panel, join me in thanking my panelists. What a, what a great conversation. Okay, with that, please enjoy the rest of the show.